Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Rail Story. We're out and about today to mark the 190th birthday of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway and the birth of the modern mainline railway. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway was founded by Joseph Sanders, a Liverpool corn merchant, and John Kennedy of Manchester, a wealthy cotton merchant and cotton spinner. The major mover and shaker behind the company was Henry Booth, another Liverpool corn merchant. The chief engineer was George Stevenson. The first bill introduced into Parliament for the railway was unfortunately thrown out in 1825 due to errors with Stevenson's survey and his performance before a parliamentary committee. The second bill received royal assent in 1826 and the railway opened 190 years ago on the 15th of September 1830. I am standing in Crown Street Park where in 1830 stood the Crown Street station of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. It was from here that that triumphant opening train started its run. From early in the morning, spectators had been thronging along the line. A grandstand had been erected fronting the King at William IV Hotel to allow people to get a better view. And one of the railway employees, Thomas Harding, the contractor for the Wapping Tunnel, had also erected his own grandstand. Milling around the carriages were princes, archdukes, members of parliament, personalities of the day, including the much celebrated actress, Miss Fanny Kemble. It was an international event, with VIPs present from Austria, Prussia, Russia, France, and even the United States. Since dawn, railway staff had been getting ready for the big day. A team of 60 plate layers had been tasked with sweeping the rails to clear them of any stray piece of ballast or obstacle which may have caused an accident. All the points had been locked out of use to prevent any train from running wrong road, but this was a decision which would later have unfortunate repercussions. Three brass bands were in attendance playing popular and military tunes. Towering over the scene were two 105 feet tall chimneys dubbed the Pillars of Hercules, or for those who were Freemasons, Boas and Jaichin, the great pillars from the Temple of Solomon, marking a symbolic entrance to the railway and carved beneath them was the motto, Neck Plus Ultra. In order to get a literal bird's eye view of the events, one enterprising spectator had had himself carried to the top of one of the chimneys on a bosun's chair. At around 10 o'clock, the firing of a signal cannon marked the arrival of the Duke of Wellington, the Prime Minister. Sadly, the first accident of the day occurred when wadding from one of the signal guns struck a spectator in the eye blinding him. The Iron Duke, wearing his trademark silk cloak, was still in deep mourning for the death of King George IV and appeared dressed all in black. His arrival was marked with the massed bands striking up Handel's air, See the Conquering Hero Comes. The special ducal carriage was a monstrous 32 feet long, 8 feet wide and carried on 8 wheels. It was spectacular, painted crimson and gilt with a canopy 24 feet long, topped by a ducal coronet. After mounting the grand ducal carriage, and with everything prepared, it was let off down the short incline through the Crown Street Tunnel, about 300 yards, into the grand area at Edge Hill. Seven other trains, consisting of open and closed carriages, were dispatched in quick succession through the tunnel under gravity. This is the grand area at Edge Hill. On the left is the 1846 tunnel to Crown Street Coal Yard. Hidden by trees is the 1830 Wapping Tunnel, and on the right the original tunnel from Crown Street. It was here at Edge Hill that the various trains were marshalled together and the locomotives coupled on. In total, there were eight trains. The first, on the South Line, headed by the Northumbrian and driven by George Stevenson himself, contained the Duke of Wellington and the VIPs. The other seven trains took the North Line. It took a whole hour for the trains to be organised. And at 11 o'clock, a second signal gun was fired. And, with much hissing of steam, waving of flags and cheering, the Duke's train glided out of Edgehill Cutting towards Manchester. 
All along the sides of the railway were thousands of cheering spectators and many enterprising landlords had set up grandstands, beer shops and food stalls to cater for the event. The second accident of the day took place in the Olive Mount cutting when a wheel of one of the engines, the Phoenix, jumped the rail. The driver of the following train, headed by the North Star, was unable to stop in time and the North Star rammed the disabled train ahead. After a few minutes, Phoenix was put back on the rails and everything continued according to plan. At Renhill, William Brotherton, a Liverpool stagecoach operator, had built a grandstand and provided a connecting road service to bring people from the neighbourhood to witness this historic event. A local inn provided a grand cold collation and no doubt the alcohol flowed freely. Coming to Renhill, the home of the famous locomotive's trials, the Duke's train was stopped to allow him to view the impressive Skew Arch railway bridge, but also allow passengers in the other seven trains to indulge in a spot of celebrity spotting as their trains ran past the ducal carriage and its collection of VIPs. Arriving at the Sankey Viaduct, which spans the Sankey Brook and the Sankey Brook Navigation, the ducal train was stopped to allow the Iron Duke and the other VIPs time to view the major engineering feat of the line. Often credited to George Stevenson, the final design was the work of Jesse Hartley, engineer to the Liverpool docks. Stevenson's original idea had been a very impractical Gothic confection. Because he lacked experience in building bridges, the Liverpool and Manchester Railway Board of Directors had appointed Jesse Hartley as its consulting civil engineer. Even though George's name appears on many bridges, the actual design and construction was down to Jesse Hartley. Another grandstand had been erected in the fields overlooking the viaduct. It was capable of holding a thousand people. Admission was by ticket, costing the whopping sum of ten shillings and sixpence. A band was on hand to provide lively music and copious quantities of food and drink were laid on. A dance floor had been laid in the vast marquee and it was intended that a ball would be held in the time between the outward and return journey of the Duke of Wellington. It was now about 12 o'clock, the journey from Liverpool having taken just under an hour. It was here at Parkside about halfway along the line that the eight trains stopped to take on water. Although today a desolate spot in the middles of fields, here was built an engine shed, a couple of cottages for railway staff and facilities to water and service the locomotives. The ducal train had stopped on the south line and the first three trains in the north line had passed safely through in succession, stopping to take on water and coke and move safely out of the way. So far, so good. Despite the passengers being told not to alight from their carriages, many VIPs from the ducal train had done so and were milling about on the track. Amongst them was William Huskisson, the Tory MP for Liverpool. He had been warned by his doctor not to travel, but he had insisted. Huskisson was, to be honest, a bit of a walking disaster area. As I say up north, it was a very clutter bird. He had never been a well man and was not the steadiest on his feet as a result of a hunting accident. He had broken several limbs falling from horses and had been run over by his carriage on his own wedding day. Once, when getting out of bed, he had managed to break an arm. He was a walking disaster area, but yet, despite this, he had got down from the carriage in which he was travelling to speak to the Duke of Wellington. Suddenly, the rocket was spotted heading towards the party on the tracks. Warnings were shouted and the post horns were blown. Yet, Huskinson dithered, running first one way and then the other, struggling with option paralysis. Finally, he launched himself in the direction of the ducal carriage and he tried to climb up the open door. But it swung open, putting him directly in the path of the rocket. Rocket struck the door and ran over Huskinson's left leg. All was chaos. Women screamed and Mrs. Huskisson fainted. A tourniquet was improvised and a galloper was set off by horse to Manchester to fetch a surgeon. The wounded Huskisson was picked up on the door and put in the tender of Northumbrian and, driven by George Stevenson, was rushed at all speed to Manchester. But on reaching Eccles, instead he was conveyed to the house of the Reverend where a doctor was waiting. Huskinson sadly died later the same evening from shock. 
As can be expected, this puts something of a damper on things. A sitting MP had been run down in front of the then Prime Minister and many foreign dignitaries. The Duke of Wellington wished to call off the whole thing and head back to Liverpool. But the directors were concerned about unrest in Manchester. With great reluctance, the Duke agreed to go on. And, after coupling the ducal train with change to the Phoenix and to the North Star, the tout ensemble continued toward Manchester with considerably less rejoicing. The grand procession arrived here at Liverpool Road Station in Manchester about 3pm. Liverpool Road Station is the world's oldest surviving purpose-built railway station. And of course, it's being Manchester, rain had started to fall. As the train neared Manchester, the cheering crowd turned to boos and hisses. Manchester has always been a radical left-wing city, and many in Manchester saw in the Duke of Wellington, one of the most hated men in Britain, the personification of the worst excesses of the Tory government and of the army. Indeed, only that summer, Henry Booth, the Secretary, Treasurer and General Manager of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, had publicly spoken out against the, quote, corruption of Tory cronyism, end quote. The Duke was blamed by many in Manchester for the Peterloo Massacre of 1819. Tricolour flags, liberty bonnets and banners carrying various mottos, including vote by ballot, no corn laws, and most famously, liberty, equality, fraternity were seen all around. The Duke was greeted in Manchester with a protest. He was met with a shower of rotten fruit and thrown stones. A military guard was provided by men of the 59th Regiment. A cold collation had been arranged in the upper floors of the railway warehouse. They never seemed to provide any hot food on the day. But the Duke of Wellington remained seated in his Grand Ducal carriage whilst the other VIPs took refreshments. Rain had started to fall heavily and about half past four it was resolved to head back to Liverpool with all haste. There were no watering facilities in Manchester and even worse because the points had been taken out of use. It meant that the locomotives could not run around their trains. So the eight locomotives were sent all the way back down the line to Eccles to take on water and coke. The ducal train and six other carriages were coupled together and sent on to Liverpool drawn by two locomotives. Remaining six trains, totalling 24 carriages, were marshalled together into a single long train and started out for Liverpool about 5.20. The crowds had dispersed and so too had the festive mood. Darkness had fallen and rain was coming down in torrents. The somewhat bedraggled party arrived back in Liverpool about half past ten at night. It had been hoped the festivities would have ended with a grand dinner for several hundred guests at the Adelphi Hotel. But in the event, only 47 sat down to dine. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway project could have ended right there. But the following day, the first public passenger train travelled without mishap from Liverpool to Manchester and back, carrying 150 members of the Religious Society of Friends, better known as Koikers. The journey just took one hour and 45 minutes. Full public passenger service commenced on the 17th of September and within a fortnight the railway was carrying over 760 passengers per day between the two towns. Stagecoach operators faced ruin, being unable to compete with the frequency, speed and low cost of the railway. Despite the accident to William Huskisson, the railway was a success and the railway was here to stay. So happy 190th birthday to the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, opened this day in 1830. Thank you for watching this special episode of Rail Story. We hope you have enjoyed it. Do you have a piece of early railway history you'd like to see featured here? Let us know in the comments below and see you next time on Rail Story.